stay up here I, I just want to compliment Ray on the amazingness of his mustache is it not incredible <laughs> seriously man I, it is like I mean it's like that's that's what I want to be when I grow up is to have that kind of mustache I, I said hey stay up here for a second he's like oh come on he ran off so my bad Ray if you have your Bible I'm going to encourage you to find two places Romans 7 and just mark that spot we'll refer to that later but then uh, we'll be in Galatians chapter 5 today as a parent, I have learned that no matter what chore I give my children, it is always the hardest thing they've ever been asked to do in their lives. Anybody have that experience? Hey, will you go throw that piece of paper in the trash, the one that you were playing with, the one you colored on, the one that you cut up, would you put that in the trash? And then they act like they're a camper at camp melting. <sighs> I can't do it, right? It's so hard. It's like literally just swipe it into the trash can. You know what I'm saying? And, and every, everything you ask your kids to do, it's, it's like the hardest thing they've ever been asked to do. But it, as a parent, you understand the difference between, you know, hard work or something that's hard to do and something that's relatively easy. You remember what you thought when you were 17 years old about what being an adult was? And now you look back whatever age you're at, if you're more seasoned like Noel or you're young like me, you look back at different ages in your life and you say, you say man, I thought that was hard back then. But now I realize it really wasn't that difficult. Now what I'm facing is a little more challenging. One of the interesting things about the Bible is that Jesus asks us to do really hard things. I want to just share one with you. It's going to be on the screen. It's Matthew chapter 5. I want you to listen to what Jesus said. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, most of us would pause there and say, all right, I can do that. I can love my neighbor, depending on the neighbor, but I can hate my enemies. That comes naturally to us, doesn't it? But then Jesus said in the next verse, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now that's hard. But here's the question I want to ask you. In verse 43, we've got that in the bag. You know, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. We're good with that. And then verse 44, we say, okay, when God calls us to love our enemy and pray for those who persecute us, I want to just ask you a few questions. How is it possible to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? How are you going to do that? Maybe another question. Which biblical law can you follow that will help you love your enemies? Or how are you going to produce that kind of love in yourself? Because to love your enemies, can we just be honest? We don't naturally have that in us, do we? Here's another command from the Bible. Forgive others. Jesus tells us we're to forgive others. Is that an easy or a hard thing to do? It's hard. So let me ask you a question. What biblical law or command can you follow that will give you the power to forgive in the way that God calls you to forgive? What biblical statute can you adhere to that's going to give you the power to forgive? You see, the forgiveness is a command. And here's what we try to do. We try to live the hard life that God calls us to live by our own strength and power. And this is a fundamental flaw that I lived in when I was younger, and I'm going to share part of my story a little bit later, but it's something that I began to grasp a little bit later in life because what I found was I was having a difficult time living the life that God was calling me to live, and I was trying to will my way to live that life. I was trying to love my enemies. I was trying to love the people and forgive the people who had abused me when I was a child, but I was struggling to find the strength and the power to do it. I knew what God was calling me to do, but I did not, I was not able to do it. Now I want you to look in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, but Paul kind of summarized what he had been teaching in the first part of chapter 5 with this. In verse 14 he tells us, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now when I was growing up, my neighbor kicked in the ceiling of our den, got up through the rafters through our uh, patio that was unfinished, and then kicked into the ceiling of our den, 
stole some items from our home, climbed back up into the attic. I don't know why he could have gone out of the door and set a pillow on fire and burned my house down. True story. Now you think about that for a moment when God says to you, love your neighbor. You're talking about the guy that stole from us? You're talking about the guy that set my house on fire and burned up all of my Wheaties boxes with Michael Jordan on them? True story. You're talking about love the guy who burned up all of my Michael Jordan basketball cards and all my Akeem Olajuwon posters and my baseball team sheets that I'd had since I was four? You're telling me to love my neighbor. We think that loving our neighbor is easy, but who is your neighbor? Remember when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan? Who was the neighbor to the one who fell among thieves? It was the one who loved them. But can we be truthful that even not all of our neighbors are very lovable? So yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's hard for Jesus to call us to love our enemies, but it's hard to love our neighbor. And yet Paul says in verse 14, when you read the entire Old Testament, because that was the law at that time, that was the scripture, it is all fulfilled in this one command to love your neighbor as yourself. And so last week as we, as we looked at that, we began to understand what this life of freedom that God has called us to and the life that he's called us from, what that looks like. Remember what Paul said in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. I told one of my kids recently in a conversation about some things happening among their friend group. I said, you need to stand firm in your convictions. And it's okay to stand firm for what you're convicted of. And by saying that to him, you automatically know that there was something pulling him to compromise on his convictions. Can you not hear it? So when Paul says to us in verse 1, stand firm in the freedom that you have in Christ, that tells us something is pulling you away from that freedom. Something is pushing against the freedom that you have in Jesus Christ. And we've seen throughout the book of Galatians that that thing that is pulling against the freedom we have in Christ is legalism. You're looking at a reformed legalist. You're looking at someone who has been redeemed from a life of legalism. I'll share a little bit of that story in a moment. But Paul tells us to stand firm in the freedom that we have in Christ. And last week in verse 13, he tells us, You were called to freedom, brothers. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And we made two points last week, and then we'll get into the message today. Paul said you've been set free from sin, and you're set free to serve. And he said also in that verse that you're set free from the law or legalism and you are set free to love. Now in every believer today, I'm going to be speaking primarily to believers in the room. In every believer in this room, there is a struggle happening in your life and it will happen until you draw your last breath. It is the struggle between the spirit of God that lives inside of you and the flesh that you're dragging around. Now, Paul talks about this struggle in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, the Greek word for flesh there in verse 16 is the word sarx. And throughout Scripture, the flesh is used to denote a lot of different things. I'll show a few of uh, them to you on the screen. For example, in Luke chapter 24, when Jesus referred to his body... He, he talked about that he had flesh. He was talking simply about his physical form in Luke chapter 24. In Galatians chapter 3, earlier in our study, remember what Paul said. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Now the flesh there is not a same, it's the same Greek word, but Jesus who used it when he talked about his physical body, the flesh, Paul is not talking about the same flesh in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 3. In that verse, he's talking about self-effort. Remember as we studied that, you began in the Spirit. You were born again by the Spirit of God. And God saved you and justified you by grace through faith in Christ alone. Now do you think somehow that you're being made right with God by the things that you are able to do by your good deeds? And that's the use of the word flesh there. In Romans chapter 7, Paul uses the word flesh to talk about our entire condition before we meet Jesus. 
He says, for while we were living in the flesh, our sinful desires or passions. So that's a reference to what our life was like before we met Jesus. But what we find in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 is a different use of the word uh, flesh. And it's the principle of fallenness that is fully operational in our lives even when we are children of God. When I became a believer when I was a teenager, I placed my faith in Christ and Christ alone. And in that moment, I was justified by grace through faith. The Spirit of God came to live inside of me. I was a sinner saved by grace, but I was still a sinner. I still had that flesh at war against me. And that's what Paul is referring to in verse 16 when he says to us, As believers... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, if you take verse 16 and compare it to verse 1, where he talks about standing firm in our freedom in Christ, and we look again in verse 16, what is Paul saying? The flesh is constantly going to be pulling you towards sin, so walk by the Spirit of God in you. Now, this entire section is written to believers, those who have placed their faith in Christ, we know this in verse 13 because he refers to those in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the audience as believers, those who were listening to the letter. Now, as a believer, there's a struggle between the Spirit of God within you and your sinful flesh. Your, your flesh pulls you to sin, but the Spirit pulls you to the Savior. Your flesh seeks conformity to the sinful ways of the world. But the Spirit seeks transformation into the image of Christ. Galatians 5.16 was a life-giving verse to me. And I hope to be able to share some of the life that it has given to me through the years since I learned this principle. Now my faith tradition, I was raised in a Baptist church, a very conservative Baptist church. I went to a Baptist college. I was saved in a Baptist church, baptized in a Baptist church, and discipled in a Baptist church, and taught a lot of wonderful doctrine in the Baptist church. But I had a very skewed uh, and mis, uh, a, a very skewed view of the Holy Spirit of God. I was raised to believe that the Holy Spirit of God indwells you at the moment of faith, and that is true. When you place your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, and I believe that. In fact, in my ordination in the ministry. The questions about the Holy Spirit had to do with very doctrinal peculiar, the doctrinal peculiarities of the Baptist faith tradition. And what they would say is, do you believe that at the moment of faith, someone is indwelt by the Spirit of God? And I would say, yeah, I believe that. And then they would say to you, to you, and the question was, well, does the Holy Spirit of God seal you? And I said, yes, the Holy Spirit seals you until the day of redemption. But as a believer in Christ who believed that the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of me and had sealed me to the day of redemption, that I belong to the King, I struggled deeply with sin in my life. Have, have you ever had that experience? Do you still struggle with sin even though you're a believer in Jesus Christ? And what I found in my life is that I was not living out in the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And so as, as a believer who believed that the Holy Spirit had certain jobs. He indwells me. He seals me. But I would read things like this, flee fornication. And yet, I was struggling with lustful thoughts. You ever struggle with lustful thoughts? Even as a believer? And I would read commands like, or, or, or scriptures that say that God despises the pride of people, a proud look. And yet, I struggled with the sin of pride. I was reading the Word of God, and I was looking for a law or some kind of biblical principle that I could follow or keep in order to overcome the sin problem that I had in my life as a believer. Here's the problem. There's not a law that you can follow in order to love your enemies. There is not a law that you can follow when you are called to forgive. There is not a law that you follow in order to flee fornication. The power to overcome sin in our lives is not your ability to do certain things by your willpower. You know why so many men struggle with an addiction to pornography? It's not the ease of access to pornography. It's that we are living without the power of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives on a daily basis. 
Do you want to know why so many of us struggle with pride and fornication, looking at things and lusting? Why we struggle with greed and pride? It's because we are not living in the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And Paul is going to tell these believers, he tells them in verse 16, walk by the Spirit of God. Listen to me. The key to victory over sin and you, excuse me, over sin is not you finding the willpower to overcome your sinful desires. The key to victory over sin is not you finding the willpower to overcome these certain sins in your life. The key to victory over sin in your life is not knowledge of the law of God. The key to victory over sin in your life is not obedience to the law. The key to victory over sin in your life is the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of you. Now listen to me. This is where I was flawed in my thinking as a young believer. The Holy Spirit is not something that you have as a believer he is someone who has you. I want you to hear that again. The Holy Spirit of God is not something that you have as a believer, like it's just some gift, an object that God gave you when you place your faith in Christ. Listen to me. When you place your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, who is the third part of the Trinity, took up residence in your heart and in your life. He lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit of God does. And the Holy Spirit empowers you to live in victory over sin. Write that down. The Holy Spirit empowers you to live in victory over sin. Remember in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6 that Paul said, As sons of God, God has sent forth the Spirit into your heart so that we can cry, Abba, Father. Do you know what that means? As a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit has been sent to live inside of you. We sing songs sometimes, sometimes that are theologically inaccurate. I want you to know something about the Holy Spirit of God. He doesn't live in this building and wait for you to come back next Sunday so that you can experience him. He lives inside of you as a believer. You don't have to wait to worship him and commune with him and walk with him Sunday to Sunday. He lives inside of you. He lives inside of you. He lives inside of you, and he gives you the power over sin in your life. Ephesians 1 tells us that the Holy Spirit lives in us at the moment of faith. Now, the Christian life is often characterized as a journey, and on this journey, the Spirit of God is at work in your life and mine to transform us into the image of Christ. We call this, the theological word is sanctification. It's becoming more and more like Jesus, set apart for his special purpose in our lives. So in verse 16, when Paul uses the word walk, that word actually means to live. So we might read Galatians 5, 16 in this way. But I say, live by the Spirit. That word walk in verse 16, it's two Greek words, peri, which means about or concerning on account of or because of, around, and then pateo, which means to advance by setting foot upon or tread upon. So walking or living in the Spirit means this. It means advancing step by step in your journey with the Holy Spirit, concerning the Holy Spirit, because of the Holy Spirit, near the Holy Spirit, and around the Holy Spirit. Every step of your journey is to be controlled by, guided by, or because of the Holy Spirit. That's a lot of talking, I know. When we think of living, when we say, how's your life? What do we think of? Well, my family's good. My job is good. I have enough money to pay the bills. I'm generally happy. But what really makes up your life? When you look back at your life up to this moment, each, each moment of your life is what your life is. So it's the conversations at breakfast with your toddler. It's the moments when your child graduates high school. It's the moment when your child enters junior high for the first time and they're struggling with their identity there and finding friends. I mean, these, all these everyday moments of our lives, that is our life. And so at a funeral, your friends and family get up and they tell the story of your life. And the stories are typically the everyday moments of your life that they will miss the most about you. That's the idea when Paul says to walk by the Spirit. It means to live 
in the everyday moments controlled by the Holy Spirit. For example, when you chose your college that you were going to attend, how many of you genuinely sought the leadership and direction of the Holy Spirit for that? When you got up to go to work last Friday, how many of you sought the Holy Spirit's direction in your life that day and said, Holy Spirit, show me today what you need me to do in order to advance the kingdom of God? You see, what we do is we live our everyday moments not in the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet the power of God to overcome sin in our lives is present every moment of every day. And so Paul says, walk by the Spirit of God. And you might be saying, all right, Robbie, that's like super spiritual talk. And that seems like way too much. I had a friend one time in Walmart. She was looking for a certain color of lipstick. I was not present. My wife told me this story. Now, this young lady was a one, is a wonderful Christian lady. But I'm just going to be honest. Like, it was a little too much Holy Spirit stuff for me at the time. You know what I'm saying? You ever been around those people? It's just a little much. And I have to admit, I was wrong for my thinking. But she would see every moment of every day as an opportunity for God to do something or guide her in her life. And I wasn't there yet. So she was looking for a certain color of lipstick and could not find it on the shelf at Walmart. I don't know if Walmart's a good place to shop for lipstick, but that's where they were. <laughs> and in the aisle, my wife is standing there. She prayed, God, I need that color lipstick. I guess that's really important to have your own certain color, right? Like my shirt, you got to have a certain color. And when she got done praying, on the floor under the shelf was one tube of the lipstick that was her color. And right there in the aisle at Walmart, she began to raise her hands and give thanks to God. And my wife was kind of freaked out by it. <laughs> but she really believed every moment of every day was to be controlled and lived by the power of the Holy Spirit inside of her. And I was not at that position or point in my life. And so what happens in our lives is we say, that's too much. To walk moment by moment with the Holy Spirit to seek his guidance. And then I would ask the question, well, maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's the reason why so many of us are struggling with sin. is because we're not living the everyday moments in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because in verse 16, Paul says, When you walk by the Spirit of God, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Do you hear that? That's a promise. In fact, the Greek language there is a double negative. It means in no case, never, not at all, when you walk by the Spirit of God, you will not do the works of the flesh. When you walk by the Spirit of God, you will not fall into sin. You want freedom over whatever sin you're struggling with in your life. It's not in your ability to will yourself over that sin. It's the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you that will set you free. So know this, when you're sinning, you are not in that moment being guided by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will never lead you to sin. He will only lead you to victory. In verse 17, Paul describes this battle. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For they, these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Yesterday I had the joy of sending a meme to two of my friends and it said, just announced by ESPN, the Cowboys are eliminated from the playoffs. I love it. <laughs> the season hasn't even started yet, and they're already eliminated from the playoffs. I, I love it. As a Texans fan, you, you just can't be a Cowboys fan because Cowboys rule Texas. You know, they're still the team in everybody's minds. I don't know why, trying to live in their glory days. I mean, if you walked around talking about what you did in 1988, you'd be embarrassed, right? I mean, that's the last time they won a championship or whatever the dates are. Who cares? But in verse 17, he says the spirit and the flesh, they're in opposition to each other. They are opposed to each other in every single way. Verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. One of my kids ate ice cream before dinner recently. And we had told them specifically when they asked, can I get some ice cream? You have to wait till dinner. And so my children, not being wise sinners as they are, left the bowl out with the chocolate shell from the you know, magic shell that they put on it. And I asked them, why did you eat the ice cream when I told you not to? And they simply said, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> you ever felt that way? <laughs> but not about ice cream. 
but about sin? You ever just felt like it's had such a grip in your life that living in victory over that sin is impossible? Paul said in those verses that they are opposed at the end of verse 17. The spirit and the flesh are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Now, if you mark Romans chapter 7, I want to go there very quickly. But in Romans 7, Paul speaks extensively about this reality in our Christian lives. I'm going to read these very quickly. In Romans 7 verse 15, not verse 14 as I put on my notes, verse 15, he said this, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I don't do the things I want to do, and I end up doing the things I hate. You ever sinned and found yourself hating the sin and even despising yourself because you found yourself in that same sinful place? Get in line. The Apostle Paul says, that's me. He said in verse 19 of Romans 7, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Can I get a witness in the house? I mean, we've all been there, have we not? And then Paul describes it like this in Romans 7, 24. Wretched man that I am. That's that feeling that you have when you find yourself in sin. You feel so wretched and sinful and dirty. Paul says, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? There was a Roman punishment when someone would murder someone. Sometimes they would be sentenced to be chained to the dead body that they had murdered. And oftentimes being chained to that dead body they would themselves end up getting sick and dying as the murderer. In fact, the poet Virgil wrote this, the living and the dead at his command were coupled to face, were coupled face to face and hand to hand till choked with stench in loathed embraces tied, the lingering wretches pined away and died. That was his description of this Roman punishment. They would chain them to the dead body. And Paul refers to that when he says in Romans 7, 24, who will deliver me from this body of death? I'm saved by the grace of God. The Spirit of God lives inside of me. But wretched man that I am, I'm carrying around this old flesh. And I'm chained to it. Back in Galatians 5, Paul says, Stand firm in the freedom that you have in Christ. And Christ has not set you free so that you can go sin and do what you want. He set you free to serve and to love. But can we just be honest? In our lives, we still drag around that body of death, don't we? The salvation of God in our lives is salvation from the penalty of sin. When you place your faith in Christ, the Spirit lives inside of you, seals you to the day of redemption. You're His forever. But then we are also one day going to be saved from the presence of sin. That's in eternity. When sin is eradicated, there'll be no more death and no more tears, no more sorrow because the former things are passed away. Everything has become new. But between that moment where you place your faith in Christ and you're saved from sin's penalty and that moment in eternity when you're saved from, from sin's presence, the power of sin in your life can be broken, but it's going to be a struggle. But it is not a struggle that you're supposed to fight by keeping the law. You are to fight this battle through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the law is fighting in your strength. And we've learned there's not one person in this room that has the power to live a perfect life and keep every law, can we? That's why the cross was necessary. The cross was necessary for salvation from the penalty of sin, but it was necessary for you to have victory over the power of sin in your lives. And God does not leave us without help. He sends us the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to live inside of us and give us victory over sin. You see, in verse 18, he tells us that there is no law. That if we're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. We're under the law when we're trying to keep all the rules in order to be right with God. But he says, if you're walking in the Spirit of God, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The power of sin will be broken. So he says in verse 19, if you're wondering whether you're walking with the Spirit or living, uh, gratifying the desires of the flesh, he says this, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Am I walking by the Spirit or am I gratifying the desires of the flesh? 
Paul says, well, here's a mirror. Look into this list. It's not exhaustive. But are these things evidenced in your life? You ever been sent to the store for fruit by your spouse and felt like you're going to have a panic attack looking at apples? <laughs> hey, I want you to go get some honey crisp apples. I'm like, okay, honey crisp. Don't forget that. Because there's a lot of them, right? There's Gala. There's somebody's granny has apples up there, whatever. <laughs> and so you start picking the apples and you pick one up and you're like, is this one too big? Is it too small? But you know certain things you look for. Do not, under any circumstance, bring one home with a bruise. <laughs> Do not ever bring one home that has a scratch. I'm speaking for you, not my family. But I'm just saying for, from your experience. Don't ever bring one that's squishy when you, when you touch it. So with an apple, it's kind of easy to know when it's a bad one, at least on the outside. But where I really feel the pressure is when she wants an avocado. <laughs> oh, it's like... Just squeeze, and if it gives a little, that's ready. But if it's too much, and I'm like, oh, boy. Like, I mean, all of our strength, our strength with our fingers is different. I'm very strong, you know. And so it's like I can squish an avocado with my bare hand. I don't know if you can do that, but I can. And I've done it in the, in the HUV, and they just kind of put it back and buried it, right? But, but some things, it's not, so, it's not so obvious when it's bad, right? And so you just feel that stress in the moment about, man, is this good or not? Paul says the works of the flesh are obvious. Sensuality, you're not walking in the spirit. Drunkenness, you're not walking in the spirit. I mean, it's obvious. If you lie, you're not walking in the spirit of God. If you're greedy, you're not walking by the spirit of God. It's obvious, Paul says. So we don't have to sit there and wonder, is this right or wrong? Is it wrong for me to be drunk? Is it right? Am I walking by the spirit if I'm drunk? Paul says, obviously you're not. Because the works of the flesh are evident. They're obvious. Paul says to the Galatians here that none of these things should be evidence in the life of a believer in Jesus Christ. In verse 17, Paul saw that the Galatians had been giving in to the sinful desires of the flesh and reminded them of this constant battle in our lives. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 18, Paul had lamented that he struggled in the same way. You see, most of us try simply to will our way to victory over sin, and that leads to constant frustration for us. High school banner, walking down the hallway at Aldine High School. If you put your mind to anything, you can accomplish anything. And it's like, really? If I put my mind to it, would I ever be able to jump over a Suburban? No. Because you don't have the mind or willpower to do certain things. And this is the way we approach it. If I just think hard enough, if I just do, uh, you know, will myself to this and I'll overcome the, this sin in my life. And Paul says, you will not on your own power. It has to be by the Spirit of God. So are there works of the flesh evident in your life? Then Paul says to us, yield to the Spirit of God and give God control of those areas of your life. Because then he continues in Galatians 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. I want you to underline the word fruit for a moment. We're going to come back. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You will not be able to produce those things by keeping a law. But I said to you to underline the word fruit. The word in the Greek language there is not fruits, plural. It's one. I had this idea, and many Christians have this idea, simply this. That yes, I'm a believer, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, and the fruit of the Spirit, one of them is, is love. But I have the right to have a list of people that I'm not going to love. I'm not going to love someone that hurt me. I'm not, not going to love someone who gossiped about me. I'm not going to love someone who in some way has offended me. And then we look at the cross and we see Jesus hanging there and we ask the question, is the cross of Jesus greater than any offense and any hurt? And of course it is. So if Jesus could die and from the cross say, Father, forgive them, then you can live in forgiveness. But it won't be by your power, by your willpower. It will be the Spirit of God who is the same as the Spirit of Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he says in these verses that the fruit of the Spirit is one. So when we read through that list in verse 22 and 23, 
The Holy Spirit will empower you to live a Christ-like life, and those things will be evident in your life. This is not Luby's Cafeteria Holy Spirit, where you take what you want, I'll take the love and the joy, but I'm going to leave the patience for someone else. The fruit, singular, of the Spirit in your life is all of them. It's all of them. The works that we read about earlier, the works of the flesh, that word is plural. And so you'll see some of those works of the flesh in your life, but the fruit of the Spirit is one, and you will see all of them evidenced in your life. And here's what Paul is saying to us. When we walk in the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is going to produce these, this fruit in your life. I love the way Alistair Begg said this. I, I'm going to quote this twice. Because I want you to write it down. I wish I'd put it on the screen for you. We are saved by faith, not by fruit. But our faith cannot be fruitless. Say it again if you want to write it down. We are saved by faith, not by fruit. But our faith cannot be fruitless. If you look into your life and the Spirit of God is not producing the fruit in your life, then you need to take a look at your faith. You need to take a look at your walk with God. If you're not finding yourself loving and being joyful and being kind and goodness and patience and all those words that are listed there, then look at your life and ask the question, am I walking in harmony with the Holy Spirit of God? Because if you look at uh, verse 24, the next verse and those who, uh, excuse me, yeah, in verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The old Robbie pre-Jesus that lived in the flesh is dead with Christ. So why Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's not me, but Christ living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life that we live now is not lived in the power of Robbie's flesh and will. It's lived by the Spirit of God. And here's how we do it in verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. <laughs> camp's amazing to see kids' lives change. But one of my favorite memories from camp you're going to think I'm a horrible person for this, but I'm just going to share it with you. And if you had been there, you'd have uploaded it to YouTube because you know it would have gone viral. We used to do these things at camp called Piney Wood Olympics. And there would be a lot of different races, 100-meter dash, whatever it was. But my favorite event to watch was the three-legged race. When I was a youth pastor, our kids would do it. There was a kid from another church. I feel terrible. I, mean, I really feel like a monster here for saying this, but, but it, it was hilarious. There was a kid that just was super defiant all the time every year at camp. And she lined up to do the three-legged race with her friend. Now, if you've ever watched the three-legged race, it's one of the most hilarious, enjoyable things. The key to winning the three-legged race is what? Steps together. You cannot have your leg pulling the band because the moment that happens and you get out of step, you're going to fall. And this girl... I'll never forget it. I was sitting on the table. It's, I mean, this is awful that I'm smiling. <laughs> I, I really do. I feel like really bad. They're running this three-legged race, and they were, they were in step with each other, and they were dominating her and her friend, and they made the turn around the cone, and they're coming back for the finish line. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> and there was a small hole in the ground that was covered by grass. The grass had been mowed level, but there's just a little dip. You know, and you've ever had that where you step in it? Well, she did in that three-legged race. And when that happened, all the synchronization ended. And this girl, when I say fell face first, I mean bounced off the ground like a basketball. I mean, it was the most, un it was, I thought, she's going to die right here. And that's why I should not laugh. <laughs> but she got up and she, she had that, you know, that, that moment where you'd feel like, I am dying. I'm drawing my last breath. And she's doing that. And I'm looking at the table like, oh, my word, what did I just saw? Why did I not have my video out, you know, recording it? Right? It was that moment. I rush over there and help her. But what happened in that race, they were so far ahead, but they got out of step with each other because she stepped in that hole. They lost her balance, and she fell, and they came in last place. And if that's not a picture of my life, I'm not standing here today. 
Paul said in verse 25, to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, where do you want me to go today? And then wherever you step, I step with you. Walk by the Spirit of God. One of my favorite memories with Leslie was a date night. We went down to see the Houston Symphony. If you've ever been, it's a really wonderful thing to experience in the, in the hall there. I walked in. It's my first time to go to the symphony, and it sounded awful. <laughs> it's just like, rah, 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 you ever been? And everybody's playing their instruments, and everybody, I, I'm like, what are you playing? It sounds like a horror film track. And everybody's just, rah, 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 rah. and then there's this moment. The first chair violin stands up, and the entire orchestra goes silent. The first chair violin plays on the violin a note. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe E. I'm not sure. An A. That's what I said. I just said it in different than Texas. My bad. You thought I said E. I said A. That's what I said. So sorry about that. I know we got band teachers in the room, okay? All right, it's an A. I don't have perfect pitch, okay? But she stands up and she plays an A. And then there's a pause and the entire symphony plays an A. And what they do in that moment is they tune to the first chair violin. But then there's an even more fascinating moment. After that, the conductor comes out, bows to the crowd before the song, and then gets on the podium, lifts his hands up, and then begins with the stick in one hand and with the hands to begin to count off for the symphony. And then at the right moment, everyone knows exactly when they're supposed to come in. And this band, this orchestra that had just sounded like a mess just 15, 20 seconds ago is now playing a beautiful symphony that is just so awe-inspiring. You feel like you're being lifted out of the chair. Goosebumps galore. It's incredible. The reason there's thunderous applause at the end is because it is so moving to see Paul, as he concludes this teaching on walking with the Holy Spirit of God, he says, walk in step with the Holy Spirit of God. Wherever the Holy Spirit leads you, however he directs you, you walk in obedience to him. And if you'll live in the power of the Holy Spirit and let him guide every facet of your life, then what is a mess of sin in your life begins to look more and more like Jesus and sound more and more like the sounds that you would imagine coming from the throne room of God because the Holy Spirit is guiding you every step of the way. So live and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't get out of line over here with your flesh. No, come back and find the Spirit of God and let God lead and guide and direct every area of your life. That's the key to overcoming sin in your life. It's not by following a law. It's by yielding to the Holy Spirit of God inside of you and letting him produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life so that the works of the flesh will not be evident in you. So will you stand today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for a moment? I'm going to just ask you to respond to something by lifting your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand just so that I can pray for you. And when I ask you to lift your hand, I'll just ask you to keep it up for just a moment, okay? And no one looking around, just out of respect for everybody in the room, I, I just want you to have a moment for a second. But is there anyone who would say, Robbie, as you're preaching today about walking with the Holy Spirit, I just want to say that as I looked at that list of the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, there are areas of my life where I need to get in step with the Holy Spirit of God Will you pray for me to get in step? If that's you along with me, will you just raise your hand for a moment and keep it up just for a moment? Thank you all over the room. Keep your hands raised. And with your hands raised, not as an acknowledgement to me, but with your hands raised to God, I'm going to lead us in prayer. And as I pray this prayer, will you pray it with me? Holy Spirit, we ask you to just take control of these areas of our lives where we're struggling. Father, we ask you to empower us to live in victory over these areas of our lives that are not yielded to you. Today, bring us into step with your Holy Spirit. Whatever the struggle against the flesh is, God, we pray for victory over it today. And we lift our hands to you and we ask for your help because you're where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. 
And so today we look to you for help. Deliver us and give us strength to overcome the flesh in our lives. And guide us with your spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name.